Welcome in, everybody. It is so good to have you back. We are doing the eighth and final offensive line uh, 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 grades here. Um, we'll, we'll do more offensive line videos, but in terms of the divisions, we've done all seven other divisions. We are now left with the AFC South. It is good to have you in. We have Simon Short with you. I am Benjamin Parker. Simon, how you doing tonight? Good, Ben. I'm getting a little sad, man. This, this is the last one we're, we're doing the grades on. We're going to have to figure out some other uh, offensive line videos to do here in the next couple of weeks. I, I know, and, and we're going to do them. And, and I think about the time we get done, the football season is just going to be right smack on top of us. We're, we're that close. Oh, yeah. So um, oh, yeah. uh, this, is the, this is the last uh, division. Um, for those of you in the audience, we will be putting out um, the entire list, one through 32. Mm -hmm. all, we'll do one video of, of quicker rankings for all 32 teams. And then also we'll have um, the top, probably top 10 to 15 tackles in football, probably the top 10 to 15 guards, and then probably the top five to seven centers in football. We'll, we'll have that as well. Um, and then football season will be right on top of us. So um, thank you for joining us. If you've been with us for the others, thank you for joining us on that as well. Um, let's start off with the Jaguars, Simon. Uh, go ahead and give us a starting five, and then we'll work our way through it. I'm like starting off with the Jaguars on, on a little Friday evening here, Saturday morning. I, I apologize, uh, yes. No, I, well I <laughs> love it. I love it. And if anybody <laughs> listening is a fan of The Good Place, I just want to say Bortles. Um, all right, left to right, Cam Robinson, Ben Barch. Uh, I think Tyler Shatley is going to win the center job, uh, at least to start the season. Brandon Sheriff and Jawan Taylor. So obviously, I mean, a guy like Walker Little, He's in competition. He's played some good snaps at, at tackle for them. Uh, rookie Luke Fortner is in a uh, position battle with Tyler Shatley for center. Um, but I, I think Robinson and, and Taylor are going to win the tackle jobs, and obviously, and, and Shatley. I think with just all the turmoil in Jacksonville, everything that Trevor Lawrence had to endure as a rookie quarterback, you know, don't, don't throw the, the third round, you know, rookie center at him as well, coming from, you know, Kentucky. Uh, it's not like you're getting a, a first round ACC or, or ACC SEC uh, a center to go in there with them. Um, just go with Shatley. He's a fine player. Fortner can develop, kind of be a swing guy for now. And then, you know, then see what happens down the road. I don't carry a lot of fond thoughts for the way the Jacksonville front office has done things for the past few years. And I think that's a sentiment carried well around the league and well around NFL fandom. But I'll keep that off the air for tonight. We'll save that for some other night. Just talking about their offensive line. I love Brendan Sheriff. Who wouldn't? This guy's been a stud for, for years now. He's not going to be indifferent in Jacksonville. Um, you're right about him starting at guard. He, they brought him in. The offensive line is instantly better. That's just the only way to put it, um, just by his presence. Now, can he pick up that entire offensive line and carry them to great heights? No, not by himself. But the offensive line is instantly more stable instantly more talented, instantly more everything with him on it. So I love Brendan Sheriff there at right guard. Um, left tackle, Cam Robinson. Robinson um, is, is one of these odd offensive linemen who actually is a whole lot better in pass protection than he is in run blocking. And I think probably 90% of the league is in the other direction. They are probably 10 to 20% better at run blocking than they are at pass blocking. But Cam Robinson at left tackle is exactly the opposite. He's actually very good in pass protection and really, really struggles in run blocking at left tackle. Um, but all things considered, good, solid left tackle. After that, there's a huge drop-off here in terms of actual what we've seen in performance. You've got Ben Barch at left guard. <sighs> Probably shouldn't be a starting guy, but he will be. Tyler Shatley is kind of on the border there of starting center, whether or not you can – upgrade him later in the season I think as you mentioned it very much up for grabs and then you come to Jawan Taylor at right tackle I don't think Taylor should be the starter I think he will be I think you're 100% right I think he is going to be the starter going through the training camp and at the start of the season I would love to see Walker Little starting there at right tackle instead of Taylor if it were me I think I've seen enough I think his rookie year looked pretty solid you know not great but solid um coming out of the second round last year. I, I would love to see Walker Little. And I think you're right about not throwing Luke Fortner, the third rounder, in to the fire right off the bat. But at some point this season, I don't think it would surprise either one of us, either this year or next year, for Luke Fortner to work his way into that starting job at center. 
So they have some hope, but they've also got a lot of questions here. I think I like this Jack Dwyer starting five better for 2023 than I do for 2022. But they're, they're already better than they were last year, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'll tell you what, uh, our, our other video going up tonight, I was a, I was a little more down than, than I am in general and, and you in some cases. I'm pretty high on this group. I actually like this group. I, I, I think I'm, I'm looking at some of the specific traits and I'm seeing where they're going to fit in a little bit. Now, that's assuming a lot goes well in Jacksonville. A lot, a lot of the right things happen. But I think bringing in head coach Doug Peterson is really going to right the ship in a lot of ways. And there's enough traits when it comes to a Jawan Taylor or a Tyler Shatley or a Ben Barch that I can see where they all kind of fit in and come together. Now, I can also see the flip side where it could all go very wrong very quickly, a la the last handful of seasons with those guys. Um, but, I mean, Jawan Taylor has has traits that I still really like. He's still a good mover out in space. So if you wanted to do something creative where you were running sweeps out to the right, and because Brandon Sheriff can still move, man, even though he's a little bit like the Teron Armstead where you kind of have to factor in he's going to miss some games. But he's not slow in the games he plays. He can still get out and move. So if you want – Taylor and Sheriff to get on the move together going to the right. That can look pretty good with Taylor's skill set. Uh, Shatley between Barch and Sheriff, who are strong guys with, with pretty good awareness at pass pro, is going to hold up all, all right if he's not getting overloaded too much and he has those guys to help him. Ben Barch next to Cam Robinson, who, yeah, isn't as good of a run blocker as he is a pass blocker for sure they kind of play off each other nicely because Barch is that just like physical downhill kind of player, but not as great in pass pro. Whereas Robinson is extremely good in pass protection, great length, great anchor. And I do like the the physicalness that he brings to the run blocking, even if he's not the road grader, get to the second level. He's a guy that if you want him to collapse into the offensive line, well, one of the plays I actually hate the most is when you kind of run in the direction with your offensive line, right? Most most zone blocking schemes do that, but he's at least a big body that's physical and he can really collapse and get down. So if you run away from that, if you run to the left side and have him head towards the right side, you can open some. So there's, there's enough stuff there that you like. Now, obviously you could get in and, and we just saw it last year. You could play to the exact opposite of all of their strengths and, and it could go really, really wrong really, really quickly because they're not perfect players but I think they're good enough players individually that if you're smart, you can, you can scheme this up. Right. And you mentioned it with Brandon Sheriff, you bring him in, he automatically elevates those guys next to him who are, who I think, well, they might not be the weakest on this group. Ben Barch is there. I think he elevates them enough though, that, that they're going to get to a respectable kind of, kind of point in the season. Yeah, I agree. And I, I do think they are going to be respectable and competitive. I, I, I'm higher on Doug Peterson than I think a lot of people are. I feel like a lot of people forget how good Peterson was during those couple of seasons, including the one Super Bowl win where they went toe-to-toe with Nick Foles at quarterback versus the evil Empire New England Patriots, and they came out on top. And, and Peterson's very creative. Uh, he doesn't mind changing where he needs to. You know, did he end his time out there in, in Philadelphia the greatest? No, but I think he instantly brings a lot of stability to Jacksonville, and, and I like what they're, what, what they're doing in terms of bringing in Peterson. I like Peterson better than I like the front office, to be honest, by a long shot. So, but uh, your, your point about the, the, the attributes there on the offensive line is very well taken. There's enough elements here. There's enough ingredients to where if somebody is open-minded and gets everybody in the right spot, and, and, and is creative in the play calling. There's enough ingredients here where this offensive line can be very competitive. And we've noticed this with several other teams. They haven't ignored the offensive line. They've tried to at least fix it. You can't fix all the problems in a single offseason, and they haven't here. But this is an upgraded offensive line. It is instantly better than what it was last year and for the years prior to that. No question about it. Yeah, and and you mentioned so the so the additions they've made and, and kind of what they'll look like a year from now. I think it probably will end up being Walker Little, right? The, I mean, Cam Robinson. Have they worked out his long term deal yet? I don't know. He's on the franchise tag for the season. 
Juwan Taylor is going into his third year. We'll see. I don't know if he got his fifth year option picked up. So, so little is going to factor into this offensive line at some point next year. Yeah. Luke Fortner, you would expect will as well, whether Shatley maybe moves to left guard and Fortner plays center or Shatley goes to the bench and Barch plays guard again. Um, but, but it's in a good place. And, and I think, like you said, I I'm high on Peterson. I'm, I'm excited to see what he's going to bring for Lawrence and, and for this run game and the offense overall. Yeah, I agree. And, and looking looking beyond 2022, if Sheriff stays healthy and, and age doesn't start to whack him at all, he's he's an upgrade. He, he's an, he's a, a difference maker at right guard. Um, if Cam Robinson leaves because of money, then Walker Little takes over one of those two tackle spots, and then you just kind of figure out what you want to do between Juwan Taylor and bringing somebody else in. But I like Fortner and Shatley moving forward at the center guard combo it could be a heck of an offensive line a year from now. Um, the ingredients are there this year, but I think it's a year too early. Um, but I, I really like what they have going beyond this season. Depth-wise, um, I don't see a lot. I, I, I feel like I, – I, I, I know I'm undergrading Taylor, Jawan Taylor here a lot. You, probably, you might like him a little bit better than I do. Um, if you count Jawan Taylor as, as one of the starters, and I think he will be, that brings Little and Fortner in off the bench. So that's seven right there. Anybody else we ought to be looking at off the depth chart here? Uh, quick answer, no. Uh, <laughs> there's, not, there's not a lot there. I mean, and still, most teams would kill for two guys that you're happy with going in, right? But they're, they're both pretty young. You wouldn't love to see either. I mean, Walker Little maybe um, in terms of if they had to play for a long stretch of the season. Um, I, but I – I do think that's kind of where, where the buck stops with those two guys. Yeah, I agree. You know, th- and there's more guys here we could list. We've got a whole list of guys here, McDermott, Richardson, Martin, et cetera, et cetera. Are these guys that you're happy with coming in and getting a lot of playing time? I think you agree that, that they are probably not. Okay, so uh, what's your grade here on the, on the Jaguars? Oh, oh, how high do I want to set the bar? Because, I, like I said, I, I like this group. I'm going to go – I'm going to go B minus and that seems a little crazy, but you know what? I just gave, I gave the jets a B minus in our last video. And I, I feel very similar in this group that I, that I do with the jets. Um, I like their core pieces. I like a couple young guys coming in off the bench. I, I, I think there's one kind of weak link um, in the group. And, and I think there's one guy that, that elevates the group here for the Jags, maybe even a little more than the Jets, but I, I think overall that the starting group is, is going to be solid enough. Um, I like the tackles and yeah, maybe I'm a little too high on Jawan Taylor. Maybe that's my, like my, yeah. my stone cold block kind of uh, I'm betting the house on this guy and, and we'll see how that works out. Um, and, and then you just add those two young pieces kind of, kind of a tackle and center off the bench there. So I'm going to go B minus and then, I, I'm thinking that's going to be at least a couple grades higher than than what you're going to give them. Yeah, you're right, and, and this and, and no surprise here. Again, some of this is because I skew lower, you skew higher, but a lot of it is projection based, right? Yeah. Um, if we put Jawan Taylor off to the side, um, Bart, Shatley, Fortner, I like them a year from now. I think you like them better right now going into the season. So it, it, yes, I'm coming in at a D plus. I thought about moving it up to a C minus uh, just because of Sheriff. But there's so many question marks. Once you get past Cam Rob- Robinson and, and Brandon Sheriff, everybody else has room to prove that they belong in this football field. Do I think they can do it? Yes, I really do. I think I think uh, Shatley can prove it. I think Fortner can prove it. I think Barch maybe even possibly can prove it. But I still think they have a lot of work to do to show that. So um, it, for those reasons, I'm dragging this grade down. But I really, really like – I think they've got four locked in starters in 2023 is, is the way I look at it, but I think they still have work to, sh- to show that for 2022. So I'm, I'm somewhere in the D plus C minus category and, and you're at the B minus category for Jacksonville. It's our um, widest range, else? I think, I think that's our yeah. widest range. That'll be, this is going to so be really too. fun to watch. I'm really excited now. <laughs> yes. I'm really excited to see this. <laughs> But I did like them better than I thought it would before we started sitting down and doing the grades here on, uh, on this offensive line stuff. So um, right, credit right. to them for, for, I think, a good body of work here yeah. right now versus what we saw two years ago. For sure. Um, 
Tennessee Titans, starting five. What you got? This is interesting. There's a couple position battles. If it were up to me, and this is where I had it before, like OTAs and, and mini camps and, and things, after the draft, he, here's the way I had it. This isn't what I think is going to end up happening. But I had Taylor Luan. I like Dylan Raduns at, at left guard. I think that was a I thought that was a possibility. Ben Jones at center, Nate Davis at right guard, Nicholas Petit Frere, the third round pick at right tackle. What it seems like is ha- what that would do is kind of open you up to have your young guys who you've drafted fairly high on day two in, in Dylan Raduns and Nicholas Petit Frere, getting them both in the starting lineup. Now it seems like coming out of camp or going into camp. There's going to be two position battles, and it's going to be left guard is going to be between Aaron Brewer and Jamarco Jones, and right tackle is going to be between Raduns and Petit Frere. So they're going to pin those two guys kind of up against each other at, at right tackle. I guess they like to fit better for Raduns at tackle, which, which makes sense. Um, he's kind of like a lankier guy, so that, that makes some sense. And they want to see Brewer and Jamarco Jones at left guard. I think Jamarco Jones is going to end up winning that job. It sounds like he might actually be the front runner. I also think when it comes to Tennessee, you look up and down their lineup, they're just old school, man. They want size. They want to hit you in the mouth. I like Aaron Brewer, and they like Aaron Brewer, despite the fact that he's so undersized. He's reportedly gotten up to about 290 uh, this offseason. He was 275 when he came to the team two years ago. Um, I, I just don't don't think ultimately they're going to go with that with, with the guy that's small at guard. I think he's going to be – I think he's their center apparent. Uh, to Ben Jones, who, if I look real quick, is is on the the other side of thirty at this point. I won't say the wrong side because I don't I don't believe in that. Uh, but he's I mean he's thirty three. So I think Brewer's going to kind of be locked in as your swing interior guy. Jamarco Jones is going to be your big body like physical guy at left guard, and then I think Radunes is going to get the nod over Petit Frere. But I think long term, best bet for this team is Radunes ends up playing guard and. and Frayers as it at right tackle. There's a lot going on there. And for yeah. the audience watching, it's probably hard to follow because we don't have uh, we don't have PowerPoints and stuff all, all up for you to see. But that does give you an excellent feel for exactly what is happening on this Tennessee offensive line right now. Um, they've been good on the offensive line for quite a while. You mentioned old school. They're tough. They're straightforward. Mm-hmm. They get it. They know how to build an offensive line. I trust that eventually they figure it out. I think it's going to be a rough start to the year for the Titans on offensive line. If I could fault them for anything, because I understand a couple of the guys that they, that they have let go, there, there are money problems in Tennessee, and it's forcing them to make decisions that they, they really didn't want to have to make, but you can't pay everybody. So I, I have no fault there. If I could fault them for something, it might be that they haven't drafted offensive line well enough over the past couple of seasons to kind of be prepared for these offense, uh, for these financial decisions that they've had to make. Not a big deal. Again, I trust this franchise to figure out the offensive line. It just might be a little rocky here at the start. I like Ben Jones at center, even though he's on the north side of 30. Um, he's a stud at center. Uh, one, of the, one of the better uh, centers in football, and not top five, but one of the better centers in football. Uh, Nate Davis at right guard, you can, you, can, you can put that in ink there. He struggles sometimes in pass protection, but that's okay. He'll be fine there. Um, he's, he's excellent in run blocking. Dylan Raduntz, I think that's the guy that you haven't seen enough of that you really hope catches on here because uh, you've got a second-round draft pick in him. Um, so you hope he can get back on the field. That's the guy you really hope. Um, and then, yeah, I think uh, the gut position battles going on two different places. You mentioned it. Um, I'm not huge on Nicholas Petit Ferrer um, out of Ohio State, um, but he may get forced into starting action sooner rather than later, and, and he may actually get a lot of starts very quickly here for Tennessee um, just because of the high draft pick, and he does have some talent. Um, what would you pr- predict for Petit Ferrer, uh, whether he wins or loses the early battle in the long term? How do you like him coming out of Ohio State? He has some versatility. Uh, he, can play, he played both the left and the right side uh, in college, which is nice considering, you know, Taylor Lewan was a guy who was considering retirement halfway through last year. Um, yeah. And then, like you said, right tackle was a position that, that they moved on from uh, with, with David Questenberry going to the Bills. So he's in the fat, he's in the plans long-term. It, it, it might be left tackle, it might be right tackle. That versatility is there. 
The thing for me is I, I don't know if he, when it comes to Tennessee, he has that same kind of like real push and physicality that, that you would expect to see. Now, now in his draft grades, um, and, and I, I'm just pulling this, you know, from the draft network, they have the power at the point of attack as a pretty good skill of him. But in terms of being like a Tennessee Titans, I'm going to get my hands on you and I'm going to put you in, in the bleachers kind of deal. It's not quite there. I, I, I like him in pass pro, though. I, I like his length really well. I think the key for him is going to be how well he can use that, especially in pass protection. Can he keep guys off of his body? Can he keep guys from pushing him back? Because I think that's where he could have some issues. Um, but if he spends this year as the swing tackle, working on his body, working on that anchor, working on the technique, and maybe getting a little bit stronger for for the power overall, I think he could be pretty good. And and if that if it's him and Radoon's long term as your two tackles, there's potential there. But like you said, you, you got to start seeing it here pretty quickly because these are the young guys that this team is counting on. And, and in my layout, I'm putting them both in the lineup. If they're saying, no, we'll just let the two young guys battle out for one spot instead of sticking them both in and trying to get them both on the on the field at one time, that's that might be a little bit of a red flag in terms of what they think about them right now. Yeah, and I, I didn't talk about Luan at all. Obviously, Taylor Luan's been a stud in the league for a long time. But even though he's only in his ninth year, I say only, Age and injuries have really impacted him the past couple of seasons. And and once you start hitting around that ninth year, tenth year in the NFL, that's not for everybody, but that is a high statistical mark for a lot of guys to pass. It's where you really start to see a lot of guys just drop off. I think you're seeing that with Luan. You mentioned he was already talking about retirement last season. Um, and I, I'm sure a Titans fan is screaming at me right now about them not being prepared draft-wise because they spent a draft pick this year, a draft pick in 21, and a draft pick in 2020. It's not like they've ignored it, but it's, it's also not like Redunce hasn't had a chance to show us anything yet. And Aaron Brewer may very well be the heir apparent, um, but he still has to prove that he belongs in the football field yet, and he hasn't done that. Um, maybe he will, uh, but he hasn't done that yet. So I, I, I guess that's what I'm, I'm really going after, especially in consideration that you decided not to keep Quasenberry at tackle. Um, somebody better show up at tackles that you decided not to keep Pleasantberry, who actually had a heck of a season last year, all things considered. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you you take two starters from this team and, and you move on from them. So you, you better hope you have the right pieces in place from that. And when it comes to drafting, yeah, they're, they're drafting guys. But again, the fact that they're drafting, you know, players that either already aren't on the team anymore, Isaiah Wilson, that's kind of a special factor, of course. Uh, with, with some other stuff happening. But Dylan Radunes, you take in the second round, and he's in a position battle with the guy you just took in the third round instead of saying both these guys are ready to start because uh, over there at left guard, you have an undrafted player who's been in the league for two years and Aaron Brewer, and you have Jamarco Jones, who's a fifth-round pick in 2018, I want to say, for Seattle, and, and you just signed over. So you have two pretty low investment guys battling out for one position, and two pretty high investment guys battling it out for one position instead of just saying, oh, our two day two picks, they should both be on the field and we'll find a way to make that happen. That's where you're saying uh, that the draft capabilities haven't really been there for the last couple of seasons. Yeah, and you mentioned that twice now. It's not a point that I had really brought out before or even thought of before this video, but you do. You've got two high end guys fighting over one spot and maybe next year one of them slides over to left tackle if, if the one steps away. But that still leaves you with, well, what are you planning to do at guard here? And uh, you, you have potential here at center, but, uh, you know, are you convinced that they're actually high-talent guys? Maybe, maybe not. But I'm sure the Titans have the same confidence in themselves to develop an offensive line that I've already mentioned that I have in them as well. So I, I think they'll be fine no matter what. Uh, we're, we're just – this is what you and I do. We pick and hash and rake over everything. <laughs> oh, yeah. So oh, yeah. um, Titans. Yeah, Titans fans, fear not. We, 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 we uh, ultimately believe in, in what you can do at offensive line. Um, uh, depth, I, there's seven guys, I think. Um, maybe Corey Levin uh, can, can be on the depth, depth mix here. Anybody pass that for you? Oh, let's, let's look back at these guys. I, nobody really – I mean, obviously, you're in two-position battles. So, ostensibly, yeah, you have those two guys that you feel pretty good about. 
other than that, no, uh, I'm not. I'm not kind of pounding the table for for any of these guys beyond uh, whoever loses these position battles. Yeah, I agree. I I don't think the depth is great here, um, because whoever loses those position battles, let's say Jamarco Jones loses, and, and let's say I don't know, let, let's say for this year Pet, Petit Ferrer loses. Uh, how how much of depth is that? It's not great depth, I to be honest. Um, it's potential. Uh, it, it's not proven depth. And then you have Aaron Brewer back there to, on the interior. Um, I, I think he can become some depth, but again, he hasn't yet really proven that he belongs in the NFL football field either. So uh, there's some potential depth here, but it's not great to say the least. Um, what's your final grade then on, the, on Tennessee? I mean, all that said, and, and you know, if I, I just gave Jacksonville a B minus, right? I think this is still going to be a better group than that. Ben Jones is still good. Nate Davis is good. Taylor Lewan is still good. He got better as the season went along last year. I like Radunes. I think Jamargo Jones is going to be fine. Uh, I'm going to give this a B. I'm going to give it a B. I, I think there is some potential for some, some downfall and some regression here. Again, we talked about it. Ben Jones, 33. Taylor Lewan about to be 30, but but a lot of injuries. Don't love what's happened at left guard, but I still Still think they're going to be a good group and, and Derrick Henry, hopefully healthy running behind them is going to make them look even better. I think. I I'm coming in at probably a C to a C minus, but I will say this. I, I think the group that you see at the start of the season is going to be a lot sloppier than the group that you see at the end of mm-hmm. the season. Um, if, if there are no significant injuries, Um, If they get a chance to put a starting five together, I have a lot of confidence in the Titans coaching staff to figure it out, put them in the best spots, to come up with a great scheme, to put together solid play calling that will suit their offensive line. I have a ton of confidence in the Titans franchise. So I I think it's going to be sloppy in the offseason. I think it's going to be sloppy at the start of the season. And if if there are no significant injuries and they get the playing time together, the five of them, I I think by the end of the season they're going to be fine. Um, in a competitive AFC, where does that leave them in, them in the playoff hunt? If they're catching some losses early in the season, uh, maybe not a great spot, but yeah, we'll, we'll see. So I, I do like them moving forward next year. I, I think they have enough pieces here uh, to where I trust their coaching staff. So I've got them probably in the C-minus category ultimately for Tennessee. Anything else for the Titans? I think I'm, I keep thinking about them through the lens of the run game. The more I look at it, the more I am nervous about them in pass pro, though. And with the Ryan Tannehill oh. questions, that that could look pretty rough. So so whereas Jacksonville, I think they can play to their strengths. If Tennessee sticks to the run game, I think they'll look a little bit better than if they go a little more pass heavy. Yeah, that makes total sense. I agree with that. We hadn't even talked about that side of, of play calling and scheme. If, uh, if, if they get to do what they like to do, and that's run the football and then do some play action, that they will be a whole lot better benefited from from that. Um, I like to talk about the Colts so much. I'm going to save them for last, actually. And if you Uh don't mind, (laughs) Colts fans, hang hang on. I think I've got a lot of great things to say about you. I I really want to talk about the Colts, but I'm going to save them for last. So, Colts fans, please hang around while we talk about the Texans. Um, If you don't mind, go ahead and give us a starting five for Houston. Yeah, so this should be pretty easy. I've got Laramie Tunsil, Kenyon Green, Justin Britt. AJ Can and Titus Howard. AJ Can's coming over from Jacksonville. Kenyon Green, obviously the first round pick, 15th overall from Texas AM. Um, Britt, Tunsil, and Howard are, are holdovers from, from last year. Yeah, I totally agree. That's the starting five I expected you to call out. Um, how good can this starting five be if I'm just asking the question myself? Um, let's start at center with Justin Britt. Um, Britt is a is a great area starter for me. There's a lot of teams where he wouldn't start. I, I think he's okay here for the Texans. He's never been great, but you'll you'll survive with him at center. AJ Can at right guard is a guy that a lot of people have expected a lot better from for a very long time, and they haven't got it. Um, Can belongs in the football field, but certainly that's a spot that that Houston has looked at upgrading for for you know for a while now. But he'll be the starter at right guard. Um, left guard, Kenyon Green, I'll talk about him in just a second. Um, and then Larry McTunsil at left tackle. So hey, Larry McTunsil is a huge name who makes a lot of money, who has a world of talent. Hey, I, 
quick preview here. I don't have Tunsil in my top 10, top 12 in tackles in the NFL. Um, as we've gone through, um, have we seen his best? I'm not sure we have. Um, he can be a lot better than he's actually been. So I, I guess my question to you is, because I don't, based on performance, he's not in my top 12 anywhere. He's, he's just not there. But do you think Tunsil can be better than what we've actually seen from him? Obviously, his name is in the news all the time for different reasons. Uh, but uh, can, can we see Larry Tunsil get to what his real potential is when they drafted him? Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. I, you, you turn it on and he's still all this time later. I mean, it's 2000, about to be 2022. He's played six NFL seasons. And normally when you do that and you talk about a guy with potential, a guy with potential, you, you don't actually see it as much. You, you're, whole, you're using the word potential to hold on to what we said about him early in his career. But you turn on the tape and you still see all of the things that we liked about him previously. I, I think what has hurt him most of all is, is that consistent availability. But when he got to Houston after the big trade and, and played you know, 14 games each of those seasons, uh, you know, two Pro Bowls. The, the years in Miami were, were growing years, tough years. Um, again, he's never – he hasn't played a full season either. I mean, he's not doing horribly, 14, 15, 15, 14, 14. He only had the five games last year where he was hurt uh, for the most part of the season. But still a very good athlete, really good feet, uh, gets good push in the run game still. Um, my – favorite part of his game is still his hands uh that he has a quick and effective punch because which is great because I don't I mean you you look at him he doesn't look like the most physically imposing guy you know we were talking about a, a Makai Becton earlier when it comes to tackles he looks to be on the smaller side at, at least on on film right you, you get there and they're all just giants anyways but his punches is, is so good and so effective that as long as he's still doing that I think he's got everything he needs. Now, I think Kenyon Green is probably the most talented person he's played next to in, in quite a while. Um, so I think that could help what he looks like as well overall. Um, so it'd be interesting. I, I think he's good. I, I'm with you. I actually, I probably have him I'm looking at my list. I, I So I've started my tackles list. I haven't plugged in the, the AFC South yet. But yeah, he's somewhere in that like 12, 13 range. So he's kind of right on the edge for me in terms of being one of the premier guys, one of the top guys in the league. Um, I think he can get there. And but this would be the year that you would expect him to need to do it. He's got he's got the new guy next to him. The, this team should be turning around soon. Uh, but, you know, it is Houston. So we'll see about that. Absolutely. And everything you said about Tunsil is correct. I'll, I'll, I'll jump on Kenyon Green here in a second. Um, and just to be clear, Tunsil has never been bad, in my opinion. Uh, he, he's a lock-it-in starter and, and will be for as long as he wants to be in the NFL. As long as any team uh, wants to put him at left tackle, as long as he wants to play, he's a lock-it-in starter for, for, mm -hmm. for years to come. No question about that. Um, I, think, I think where between his name and the headlines so much and between people expecting him to be one of the all-time franchise greats, he, ha he has not been that. And so – I think that's where the questions start to come in. To your point, though, the injuries, and he hasn't missed a lot of games, but it's those nagging injuries that can really drag your performance. Even though they, he may have only missed two or three games, uh, he might have been dealing with an injury for an entire eight, nine, ten games of the whole year. And it might be all he can do to be out there in some of these seasons. A lot of times we don't even get that information because they don't want anybody to know that information. Um, so that could be definitely affecting his performance. Some of the contract stuff that has gone on as well, uh, that could be distracting as well. So there's different reasons why he may not have been up to his performance. I, I love his I love his ability. Um, we'll see if he, if he can get to that, that all-pro level that I think people have wanted to see out of him for years. We'll see if he can get to that level. Um, Kenyon Green at left guard. Um, I'm going to compare him here to Zion Johnson for the Chargers who I think was taken like two picks later, who would you rather have had here between Green and, and Johnson? And then you and I both love Zion Johnson, but then talk about what you think about Kenyon Green as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, Zion Johnson was, was my guy for sure. Um, Kenyon Green is a guy that has everything you look for. I mean, he has extremely good size at, at like 6'4", 325 just about. 
Um, really, really thick body. Zion Johnson's a little more of a chiseled frame. Um, Kenyon Green also, so you would think that means like Zion Johnson's a better mover. Kenyon Green on film in college was was pulling left and right. He was getting out to the second level. He was doing all sorts of stuff. So you thought, oh my gosh, this guy is bigger, stronger, faster. You get to the combine, he actually tested really poorly. And I think some of that was like timing drill wise as much as it was pure athleticism, but still some question marks about how good of an athlete is he actually. So that's, I think, going to be the turning point. Is he actually as agile with good footwork as he looked on film versus what he was at the combine. So that that's going to be the thing. Um, also an underclassman, I'm pretty sure. And, and Zion Johnson was a senior, uh, one playing at Texas A&M, one playing at Boston College. I like Zion Johnson because I think you know exactly what you're going to get. I think he's going to come in and he's going to be a – I mean, I, I think he has potential to be like an all-pro type of guard for a long time. But he's, he's the steadier player. Kenyon Green is the guy where it's uh, a little bit wider of a variance. Again, he could also be an all-pro guy. He could be a guy that, you know, just plays out his rookie contract. And, and if the athleticism at the combine is what his real level is, that's the problem. Um, but if you just take what we saw in film and, and what we saw in the college season, the 15th overall pick for, for this guy is a steal. You know, normally these interior offensive linemen get pushed down, but – he's the guy that you do it for. He's, he's the, I'm not going to say he's, he's Quentin Nelson. I'm not going to say he's Zach Martin, but he's the, the premier type guard talent wise that, that you make that selection for. Talk about Zion Johnson for a sec, sec for a second. And then I'll talk about the Kenyon green. I, you and I both love Zion Johnson. I think, I think Zion Johnson is, is steady enough, polished enough, balanced enough, powerful enough, quick enough, to where I think, and we're projecting here, I think he's a day one starter for San Diego. I think Zion Johnson is the kind of guy who will be so good that when we do the redrafts three years from now and eight years from now, he's the kind of guy who makes you wish we had taken a guard at pick number five instead of fill in the blank who started for a couple of seasons and then we let go for money reasons, you know? Um, I think he's going to be that good in in the long run. I think Green has that kind of potential. Now, I don't follow the combine very much. It's just not my preference to do that. But it's interesting, the stuff that you mentioned coming out of the combine is some of the same stuff that I kind of picked up on on film. There's, the, the, the ability is undeniable. I like the athleticism, but it seems to be inconsistent at times. And I think, I think even though Kenyon Green is going to show flashes at times, I think he's going to struggle to be consistent. Um, I think the talent's there. I think the athleticism is there. But I think he's going to struggle to stay consistent. And that's just kind of what I saw when I looked at the Texas A&M film. So I like Kenyon Green. I, I think they were fine drafting him. But I think I would have rather had Zion Johnson, to be honest about it, um, at the end of the day. So we'll see. Um, I do think you're right about Green being one of the more talented guys that Larry Mintonsel's ever you know, been able to be beside. And I don't remember who all Tonsil has been beside, so I, I stand to be correct there. But, yeah, I think you're right about that. I do think they have upgraded the talent level here on the offensive line. I don't think Green's a bad pick. I just think, comparatively speaking, you and I would rather have had Zion Johnson. Um, any more thoughts there on the starting five? Oh, let's see. I was trying to look up Kenyon Green's uh, some of his combine numbers for you compared to Zion Johnson. Um, let's see. I know this is not good. Well, okay, here you go. 20-yard shuttle, which is, you know, you don't need to do the 40-yard dash for an offensive lineman, but Zion Johnson, 4.46 in his 20-yard shuttle. Kenyon, and that was third amongst all offensive linemen. Kenyon Green, second from the bottom at 5.12 seconds. So uh, that's just a, it's a small sample size. Like I said, combine isn't everything, but uh, just a small difference in these are the top two guards and uh, vastly different scenarios uh, at the combine. Um, In terms of the rest of this group, I mean, these guys have play experience and they have play experience with this team. So that's nice. Charlie heck is good. Is a, a solid backup player. I think Max Sharping, same deal. Um, you don't want these guys starting, which is what they were, what they were doing last year and it didn't go well. But the fact that these guys have been around and been around here team for a bit is pretty good. Um, but I mean, other than that, yeah, Justin Britt, if we go back to the starters, I like his physicality. I like his anchor. He's got a little nasty to his game. He's kind of like a mini Ryan Jensen, which is pretty cool. Um, AJ can, I'm with you kind of just 
disappointing overall. He, he's pretty good in the run game. If you just need him to go forward, he can put guys on the ground. Um, but in, in pass pro, poor balance, poor poor awareness, not that great. Uh, so it gets a little dry as you go to the right side. Titus Howard uh, over there, right tackle, is, is a big question mark because he's just been moved around so much. I mean, he's played right tackle. He's played left guard. He's played left tackle for this team in his just three years already with the group. So hopefully he can stay steady and, and the Texans can stay steady and keep him at right tackle because I think he could be really good there. Um, it's just a matter of are the Texans going to kind of figure it out and then, you know, have a have a normal season, hopefully, and healthy season and let these guys play, you know, to the best of their abilities. Texans fans, if you're still watching, we apologize for being buckets of cold water here. Uh, we're, we're, we're not trying to be that, but it, we're not going to hide what we really think either. Um, it, you, you and I, I think both are bothered a lot by teams who kind of ignore the offensive line and by teams who have it's okay to have one or two guys who are backup level, great area starters starting. But when you have three or four of them, I think that bothers both of us a lot. It's almost like you just don't care about the offensive line. The Texans have had that for a very long time. They're starting to work their way out of it now. So you got Larry Matonso at left tackle, of course. You've got Kenyon Green, who I, I think can be a solid starter in the league. Whether, whether or not he can be consistent enough to be a better than that, we'll see. But I like that. You mentioned Justin Britt. You're fine at center. You still got on that right side, though, A.J. Cannon and Titus Howard. That's a struggle. Um, but they're starting to work their way out of that, so I do like that. They're not just uh, – they're not allowing this to just continually be a huge problem. Um, so I, I do like that they're at least addressing some of this stuff. You got into the depth there. Uh, you mentioned Max Sharpie. You mentioned Charlie Heck. Um, I don't like Cedric Ogbui as a starter. I do like him as a backup. I think that's, you know, that at least you have something there. I, I think he's fine there as a, as a backup. And then maybe even Austin Deculus, sixth-round draft pick, maybe he gets in the mix at some point. Um, well, we'll see. So uh, what's your final grade then on Houston? Let's see. You've been a lot lower than I have on these first two. I know I'm not going to be as high on this group as I was. I, I like Green. I like Britt. I like Tunsil. I like the idea of Howard if he can stay in his right position, but but not quite enough to say this is going to be a good group. I think I'm going to have him at a C minus, and, and that's assuming because I mean, like we said, Tunsil has had some nagging injuries, but never the big one like he did last year. I think that made a big difference ha having him only healthy for five games in total, and not just healthy for five, but only play in five games. I think was a big difference. I think. Just bringing him back is going to be big. I think Green is going to be an upgrade over – I forget which who exactly was their left guard, but let's say it was Sharping was their left guard last year. Can is the, is the big issue. But if this team is going to be a run-focused team, which they probably will be considering, you know, they're going to go with Davis Mills at quarterback, um, it – that mitigates his biggest issues if you're going to be a run-focused team. If you want to drop back and pass the ball 30, 35 times a game, you're going to struggle. Um, but but I think they're going to do the right thing. I think they're going to run the ball. I like the improvements they made. Tunsil coming back is essentially like signing a Pro Bowl caliber left tackle. Um, so I, I'm going to go C-. minus. All that said, a, a tick below average. I don't think they'll be bad necessarily. Uh, so I'll go C-. minus. Yeah, and I'm going to give them a D, which is scale-wise about where you and I tend, tend to hit here. I'm a, with me skewing in lower here. Um, once again, I, I think I said this about Jacksonville. I like what the Texans, the direction they're going. I like what they have for 2023 better, especially if they keep doing what they've started doing finally, what they should have been doing all along anyway. Um, so you have Tunts at left tackle for as long as you want him. Um, money matters aside, he's there. Kenyon Green, you know, between him and Justin Britt, I think the left side of your line, maybe not in 2022, but by 23, I, I think I like that. And then if you fix just one of those spots in 2023, right guard, right tackle, either one, um, I think you start to get into competitive to good offensive line. But for this year, the depth isn't great. It, it's okay. Um, it's, it, 
it's not that there's a huge drop off between the depth and the starters, but that's because two of the starters really shouldn't be starters, to be honest about it. Um, so hey, I'm at a D here. Um, I think they at least compete, which is something more than they've been doing in past seasons in terms of talent. So it, they have upgraded, um, but I'm at a D here for Houston. Anything else you want to plug in for the Texans? I don't think that, think that was everything. Okay. All right. Well, let's move on to the Colts, who I've already hinted at. I'm going to enjoy talking about them. I'm going to have a lot of good things to say about them. Uh, go ahead and give us a start in five for uh, Colts. Yeah, so I think this is I think this is pretty easy. I have Matt Pryor, Quentin Nelson, Ryan Kelly, Danny Pinter, and Braden Smith. Absolutely. Now, um, I've been starting off with the best guys on the, on the starting five. I'm going to start off with what I think is the weak link and go up from there. Uh, I think the weak link is Danny Pinter, yeah. uh, right guard, fifth round draft pick in 2020. Um, He's, I, I'm, I'm not yet convinced he should be getting significant playing time in the NFL, but I do think at the moment he's the guy. Um, I, I, I don't know who else they're going to plug in here. I mean, maybe you get Jason Spriggs to plug in here. Um, yeah, I, I don't know beyond that who else you even look at here. There, there's not a lot of depth here for the Colts, but he's the weak link on this offensive line. After that, business picks up real quick, all right? You got the center, Ryan Kelly, who was a, Basically a lock-in starter, assuming he's healthy. Had a little bit of injury history, but if he's healthy, Ryan Kelly is your lockdown starter, no question about it. Uh, just good, solid work there. Um, then you move over to left tackle. Um, again, Matt Pryor, very, very balanced. Um, not a dominant left tackle. He's not going to push a lot of people around, but he's very, very balanced, very polished there at left tackle. You can ink him in at starter. Um, we're moving up the ladder now real fast here for the Colts. That brings us to uh, Braden Smith at right tackle. And I'm going to ask you about Smith here in a minute. But Braden Smith is, is Pro Bowl level. Uh, he might can even get better, and that's what I'll ask you about here in a minute. But at right tackle, Braden Smith, absolute stud, um, a difference maker. He is way, way above average. And, and then you get to what to me is the best part, left guard Quentin Nelson. I think he's in his third or fourth season. I forget. He's still very young. He is already – Already in the discussion, when healthy, and again, he had a pretty significant injury, but Quentin Nelson, when healthy, is already in the discussion for best guards in the NFL. He is that good. Uh, he, is, he is everything. Quentin Nelson can pass block, run block. He's smart. Hey, everything you want a guard to do, Quentin Nelson does, assuming he's healthy. Uh, so I absolutely love what they've got going on here in the starting five, especially with those top four guys. Um, before I peel back and, and hit you up on Braden Smith, anything you want to add here to the starting five here for the Colts? Yeah, uh, you hit the nail on the head. Danny Pinter uh, is going to be a, a step down from Mark Lewinsky for sure. That that was a player that the Giants went and kind of stole. And the Colts are are confident in Pinter. He started three or four games last year. I mean, he has he has all the traits you look for. Um, nothing that puts him in that like elite high level I think even his ceiling is probably below where Glowinski was just last season but but I think he's going to be solid there but we have to see it over a full season Matt Pryor I really like even though he was a guy I forget how many games he actually started last year but he was not you know a, a full-time starter by any means but um yeah he only started five games for them last year but and it started some at guard, started some at tackle. Uh, I think he only had one start at left tackle against, I want to say it was the Cardinals game, but uh, really, really good, just everything. Just good feet, good hands, uh, good push in the run game. The Colts know how to run block, and that's for sure. And, and you know, you want to see a guy in there get some push, get some physicality, and all of these guys do that really, really well. So I, I'm pretty confident in, in what they have going. I, I, if I haven't made it obvious by now, I love the starting five. Um, nobody in the NFL has a starting five that is all studs. Um, Tampa Bay has four guys who are pushing stud category, but the fifth guy I think is a rookie or, or there's a huge drop off there at, at spot number five. Um, the Eagles have a lot of studs, but they've also got a lot of age and injury questions all over the place. Um, the Browns have a lot of solid guys that you and I like but they have a couple of question marks too in terms of just really talent level, I guess. So the Colts right here, just ter just their starting five, uh, they, they got a lot going on here, and it's, it's going to go on for a long time. Now I want to ask you about Braden Smith. 
Um, he's been a heck of a player. I mean, the Pro Bowl level, no doubt. Um, can he get – how much better can he get? Can he get to that elite all-pro level and stay there for the next five years? Do you, do you think that's in his future? All pro seems like a bit of a leap. That seems like a pretty big jump to make, especially because unfortunately it's such a subjective position to, to gray and it shouldn't be, it shouldn't, it should be very objective, but the, we know the voters when it comes to offensive line, they find the names of the guys they like in their first couple of years in the league or the guy who in year eight all of a sudden jumps off the page. But if you kind of come in as a, you know, he was a second round pick in 2018 from Auburn, like, you know, pretty low, low profile guy. You go to Indianapolis who has a bunch of good offensive linemen, including like you said, Quinn Nelson, and you're just a good to really good player. Unfortunately, no, I don't I don't think you get to that all pro level. Now, can you get to that caliber of player? Yes, I think so. Um, I think he has the unique skill set as a right tackle of being both good, a pass blocker and run blocker. We talked about this earlier where you got to be able to do both at both left and right tackle nowadays. Um, And not only is he a good run blocker, I'm sure many people listening, you know, of the thousands of people watching this video. Uh, think of a good run blocking right tackle as a road grader, as a powerful physical guy. Braden Smith can do that. He can also get out in space, which I really like, uh, which I didn't even necessarily expect going back to watch his film. I think the thing that he needs to improve on and and what I'm looking for this year for him is I want to see him kind of get to that Laramie Tunsil punch. Uh, I want to see him use that punch a little bit better, a little bit quicker um, to help with both his anchor because he is a little light in terms of a tackle um so i'd like to see a punch to get the defenders a little further away from his body right off the jump or because he doesn't have the elite foot speed even though he's agile and balanced enough to get out in space i'd like to see him use that on some of the quicker guys kind of punch them off balance a little bit so they don't just beat him right off the edge if he can use that punch and improve on that right off the bat to help with both anchor and speed rushers um, we could see him jump from a, a guy people are just like, oh, yeah, cool, the Colts right tackle to a guy at least competing for some Pro Bowl votes. Again, I don't know if he's ever going to get in that all-pro discussion with, with some of the tackles we already have. I mean, young guys like Jedrick Wills and Tristan Wirfs, Rayshon Slater, uh, Panay Sewell, there's already some young tackles that I think are going to hold down those all-pro votes you know, for the next foreseeable future, unfortunately, without too much competition. But Smith should – Certainly should be in the mix. Certainly should get to that talent level, I think. Yeah, totally agree. And, you know, Colts Colts fans already know this, but I will point out uh, they drafted Quentin Nelson and Braden Smith in the same year, 2018, first-round pick, second-round pick, number six and 37 overall. And, oh, by the way, they picked up a guy named Darius Leonard, at linebacker, that year, too. (laughs) They did a heck of a job. If if I'm going to pickle the Colts at all, because it's what we do, you know, they really haven't drafted much on the offensive line since then. I, I, they, you know, they, they grabbed Pinter in the fifth round, and uh, I, I, I'm looking here, 19, uh, let's see, uh, 19, 20, and 21. They, they didn't do a lot here uh, on the offensive line. I, I would have liked to have seen them, upon having that much success with, with Nelson Smith, it's obvious that you know how to draft and develop offensive linemen. I would love to have seen them. Somewhere in 19, 20, and 21, especially 20 and 21, use another second, third-round pick on an offensive lineman and, and continue to develop what, what is an obvious strength that you have as an organization here. Um, they didn't do that. This year they drafted Bernard Raymond. So let me talk about Bernard Raymond for a minute. Um, Bernard Raymond's a big old off, uh, offensive tackle coming out of Central Michigan, a bit of a project. Um, any chance he can move to guard in the future? Is that a zero chance? Um, if he sticks at tackle and he looks like he's worth playing, uh, you know, obviously Braden Smith isn't going anywhere. So what does that do with uh, – does that do anything with Matt Pryor? What's the thinking here for, for the Colts? You know, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Ray, Raymond is, is such a project, though, that, you know, you, you take a swing on him. When, when did they even get him? Let's pull this back up here. 
mid round. Yeah, he was number seven right? to third, seven overall. Third round, yeah. seven seven. So, I mean, th- this was a team that didn't have too many holes, and like you said, just kind of throw some stuff against the wall. I don't know if Guard is in his future. He's kind. Of, he's put on a lot of weight, but he is a guy that came to football late. When he did come to football, was a tight end. Uh, wasn't good enough to keep playing tight end, so he just kept adding weight and became an offensive tackle. Generally, it's hard to also get those guys to become a guard. Now, the way the game is played now, it, the lines are a little blurred. Depends on the team and what you do. Um, if there's a team that could do it, this is one of those teams, uh, especially if you wanted to stick him at right guard and, and stick him between Brian Kelly and, and Braden Smith. That would make a lot of people look pretty good. Uh, Matt Pryor, like I said, I also like at guard. So if Raymond can't do it and but you can put him at left tackle at some point and you could stick Matt Pryor back at guard then you might be cooking with gas but I, Raymond is such a project it, it's kind of TBD we'll have to see you know what he looks like in preseason and and what the reports are at a training camp this year yeah I totally agree um I, I think this is 100 percent true I think and that's kind of where I was going is that even on the table if and we're not talking about this year moving ahead a season or two uh, if Raymond's looking like they're developing him well and they've, they've drafted him well, if he looks like he can go at tackle and maybe not guard, which would be my expectation, mm. is it at least on the table that Pryor could move over to the guard spots? And I, yeah. I think you're right about that. I think that, you know, we're looking down the road here a season or two. I think that is on, in the mix here for, uh, for the Colts. If, if you're trying to figure out why they drafted Raymond, I guess is my point. Yeah, they, I mean, they lost a lot of guys in free agency this year, uh, and I think they knew that. So uh, maybe they weren't too worried about who who the position was or, or what the position was. But, I mean, Julian Davenport, I think, was a backup guy that they liked who, who went to the Bears. We mentioned Glowinski already. Um, just you lose a couple guys. You're, you're like, hey, who can I get in with, with some value? And Raymond's a guy that, because of his athleticism and the fact that he's fairly new to the game, that means he has a high ceiling. It means he's less likely to hit the ceiling, but it means he has a high ceiling. So, you know, it'd be interesting because he similarly, I mean, what we're talking about with him, really good athlete, gets out in space, um, good length, mirrors a lot of what we're talking about with Braden Smith. So if you can put it like a mini Braden Smith on the left side, and, you know, we talked about prior already that, yeah, that, that could look pretty good. But I think that's probably two years minimum down the road. And obviously at this point for the audience is still watching, we're, we're talking out loud here. Um, I just pulled up Matt Pryor's contract on spot track. Um, and the, the, by the way, for those of you who, who like the financial side of it, there's two great websites over the cap and spot track. They both do a great job. Fantastic job. I happen to pull up spot track here. Uh, Matt Pryor is actually, um, he's 28 years old this year. He's on a one year deal. Mm-hmm. So uh, it may be in, maybe in theory, they're looking at, we really don't want to pay him moving forward, or, or maybe we can't pay him moving forward, might be the better way to phrase it. Right. So maybe, maybe the thinking is prior moves on, even though we don't want him to. Um, and Raymond maybe in theory fills in that, that tackle spot, but again, all, all that's looking ahead of a year. So let's go back to this year, 2022 um, depth wise. Raymond's probably not depth. I, I, I'm sure a lot of people are going to be writing that you draft Raymond for depth, but Raymond really isn't depth this year, I don't think. I think Jason Spriggs is a good depth guy. I think he, you can put him in a lot of different places. Um, Dennis Kelly, I think, is maybe – Dennis Kelly might be one of the best swing tackles in the game in terms of backup guys. Probably don't want him starting, but, but Dennis Kelly, I think, is a fantastic back, backup swing tackle here. Um, beyond that, any, anybody else that we ought to be talking about here? Oh boy. Um, no, the, the, no one really stands out to you. I, now the way this team is built, the way the starters are, the way they build the, the roster. I think any one of these guys can come in and finish a game or get you through a week or two. I, I any of these, you know, put, plug and play any of these guys, I think for one week, uh, except for Quentin Nelson. But I think if you need any of these guys to play six or seven weeks, uh, you're you're hurting at that point. You're you're maybe looking elsewhere, trying to see who's uh, out there for for trade or who got cut or something like that. Because none of these guys you want starting for a long term, like you said. I think that's a very good point, and it's something you and I I think believe in a lot. 
the watershed moment for offensive lines is when you get that third stud on the offensive line, that third no doubt starter. And in my opinion, the Colts have four of those guys um, mm -hmm. who are basically you're not necessarily looking to upgrade the spot for those guys. If one of them gets injured, yeah, you're, you're going to miss that big deal. You still got three studs. Right. Um, and, and, and then you bring in a guy like Spriggs or, or like Kelly and, and you can get through for a bit. Um, so even though they, they don't have a lot of depth, you're right about the way that top four is built, top five is built. I think they'll be fine here. So, um, after all the good things we've said about the Colts, <laughs> what's your grade here on Indianapolis? Oh man, the way you said that, now I'm a little worried about what you're going to say. Uh, I'm going to go B plus. I'm going to go B. I think this is a good okay. group. You mentioned the team that I equate this group to, and that was the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, you, you've got four really good starters with two guys being, you know, all pro type players. You've got your fifth guy who, who's kind of a question mark, but fits in well with what the team wants to do. And, and then, you know, you've got a, a a bench that you're fine with, but no name that you're really excited about. I think that's what separates the teams. What gets you into the A category is either you have five really good players or you have four really good players and, and you have a name or two off the bench you really like. Uh, the Colts don't have quite that. So so I think B-plus, though, when, when you have the best guard or, or one of the best two guards in the entire league, Braden Smith, Ryan Kelly. Ryan Kelly, who I think is one of the best centers in the league. Uh, Matt Pryor, a guy we really like. B, B plus feels feels perfect for me. And ironically enough, we're going to end this this whole thing. I have the same grade too. I've got them at a B Look plus. At that. Um, Look at that. I couldn't get them into the A category. Yeah. Um, if they if they had done anything at all with with right guard, anything. Okay. It yeah. would have shoved him into the A category. <laughs> Which makes me but, feel like is Pinter a lot better than we think. If they're just sitting there maybe. like we'll just let we'll just like Lewinsky walk and we don't we don't really care. Well we're not gonna do anything crazy in the draft. We're not gonna go out and make a big right. deal. We'll just keep Pinter and, and it'll be fine. So be on the lookout. We'll see. We'll see what all that means. Maybe so. Just because he hasn't shown it yet, he's only in his third season now. Right. So playing with all these other great guys, it, it's got to rub off. It's great protection, even if it doesn't rub off. So I, uh, that, that's the only reason I didn't put him in the A category, but I, I really look, obviously I really like the Colts offensive line. Um, injuries can derail this. Um, not so much because of depth, but just because of the huge drop off. If it's Quentin Nelson that goes down with an injury yeah. or if it's Braden Smith or heaven forbid, both of them, mm -hmm. uh, this all falls apart in a hurry, but I, I don't expect that to happen. These guys, uh, this is a pretty young group, and, and the younger groups tend not to be quite as injury-riddled, generally speaking. The injuries to Nelson and Kelly last year notwithstanding. <laughs> so. Yeah, exactly, for sure, for sure. <laughs> uh, just forget about those ones. Forget about that. Right. It don't add to it. <laughs> so, all right, anything else you want to add in on the Colts or the AFC South here? Uh, no, that I think that was it. You know, you mentioned we couldn't quite get them to the A group. I only gave two A's in, in the whole for all the teams. So, I mean, that that's a really, really special group to get into. So, uh, it was fun, man. I had a great time with this. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. Um, obviously, we'll be doing things all season. Um, we've got an NFL podcast coming up here in a couple of weeks. Mm. Um, you can check out the Simon Short podcast, which covers all kinds of things. Um, you can check us out on Phantom Sports. You might be watching Phantom Sports YouTube right now. Uh, you might be watching the Sports and Money YouTube right now. You can get more of it there. Um, also, I encourage you to go over to the Phantom Sports website. Lots of articles on the NFL and all kinds of things there. Um, Simon, it's been a pleasure, man. We'll, we'll start cranking out the overall rankings, uh, and then we'll start cranking out the uh, top um, offensive lineman rankings as well here in, in the next week or so. Can't wait. Let's do it. All right. Thanks a lot. Goodbye, everybody. Have a great one. Goodbye.